Lynn, how are you doing? I'm, I'm on the right side of the dirt. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so we're going to begin your interview and we're going to start from the beginning. Basically, I would like to know where you were born. Uh, near a little town called Koppel, Pennsylvania. So it's uh, about 40 miles north of Pittsburgh. And uh, how was your childhood? Uh, did you grow up in a rural area? Oh, definitely. It's a rural area. I mean, uh, the nearest town was about a half mile away, but it was a very small town, very, not very much in it. So uh, um, so I grew up uh, in a very old stone house on 76 acres of land in a lot of forest. And so it was a real, real good upbringing as far as I was concerned. And how did you go straight from Pennsylvania to Arizona? Well, um, after I'd gotten, um, after college, there were no jobs to be had where I was. I lived in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. This was uh, early 80s, middle 80s, I think you'd call it. And, and um, it was the middle 80s and the steel mills were all closing. And that was the lifeblood of the area. And so the economies, you know, in the various towns were just collapsing left and right. And you couldn't get a job doing anything. I mean, you know, janitorial work was going to be hard to come by. Um, I was skilled in computer sciences, and so I was a good programmer. And I found opportunities in Arizona, and so I decided to make the move. And did you move straight to Dewey Humboldt? Or? No. No. I, um, I moved first to Phoenix. And I lived in Phoenix for 20 years, and I hated living in Phoenix. I'm not a city mouse. I'm just not. Uh, so it was very difficult to do, but I made my escape to a more rural area, and that was Dewey Humboldt. And how did you learn of Dewey Humboldt? Well, um, my brother and his wife moved to Arizona before I had made the move up to Dewey Humboldt. And about five years prior to my move, they moved to Dewey Humboldt, and they had I'd uh, helped them look for places, and they had uh, they decided on something. And it was in Dewey Humboldt, and so that's what they picked. And so while I was out looking for a place to live, uh, that was on my list. It wasn't necessarily my first choice, but it was on my list. And after all was said and done, I still needed to be reasonably handy to Phoenix when I needed to be there. So Dewey Humboldt turned out to be good as far as location and the surroundings and all of that. So that's how I chose it. And so when you first arrived to Dewey Humboldt, uh, did you notice the mine tailings? I did notice the tailings right off the bat. I mean, they're, they're very obvious right on the side of the highway. So it's very obvious what they are. And I was unsure. I didn't know at the time the extent of the contamination. I knew that it was mining, uh, mining tailings and, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a scar but I did not know the extent of the uh, contamination, and I didn't know uh, how portable that might be, how much it was going to get out and get into the environment. And I kind of felt that I was at a reasonably safe distance from it, uh, given that the wind would always blow a different direction. So I was not too worried about it. And do you live, or your current residence, is it in the area that's impacted by the Superfund site then? You could probably say there is nobody closer to ground zero than I am. Seriously speaking, there is, I am right between the mine and the smelter and the contamination, the level picks up at third street and south. And I am just south of third street and my property extends into the wash where some of the highest contamination is. Now the worst contamination is at the mine in it, in those tailings. But as far as anything that's traveled off of either of those two sites, I'm right in between them. Is there a specific street that you live on? I live on 3rd Street. 3rd Street. And when did you first learn about the contamination that's associated with the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter site? Well, I was a member of the Environmental Issues Advisory Committee. That's a advisory committee to the town council. And so... When I was on that committee, we uh, the committee is charged with identifying and assessing possible or potential environmental problems or threats to the community. And so on that 
uh, so on that committee, we were looking at some different issues that had uh, come up with the both the sites, the the mine and the smelter sites, but primarily the mine site because there were businesses operating there, and there were some actions by uh, ADEQ against some of the businesses there because there was there had been some violations of various sorts with various property owners, and I won't get into those details because that's unimportant. Um, but looking into that, we we became aware of the CERCLA designation that the mine had had. So that's not a Superfund designation, but it's a but it's a designation given by the EPA that says, hey, there are known contaminants here. Um, but it doesn't go so far as to say it's a threat to the community or, it, it, you know, it doesn't assess a threat to the community or a need to clean up. It just, it basically says, and you check with EPA on exactly what CERCLA means, but it basically says, yes, we know about this and there are, uh, there are issues, but we haven't gone all the way down the field to, to decide what that's going to mean. So we knew about the CERCLA designations and as we began putting pieces together, we started thinking, you know, this could really be a threat to the community. And that's where it all started. That's when I first learned that there was a real issue with the mine. And how did you first become involved in the Environmental Issues Advisory Committee? Uh, well, that's, I'm not sure exactly how it started. I think I was asked by the chair of the committee to join the committee because uh, she and I had talked about some environmental things, uh, some environmental mm, issues that, you know, we, we hadn't gone that far into it at that time yet. But I was, but uh, she said, you know, you, you, you care and you think about this well and you, you've got a good mind for it and all that stuff. So you, uh, you'd probably do well on the committee. I'd like to have you. So I said, you know, I can do that. So I did. And what are your, it seems to me that you were involved basically at the beginning, also at ground zero when the community started uh, being involved in the Superfund site with these issues too. Yes. Uh, as a part of the committee, uh, when we looked at the situation with the, uh, the contamination at the mine and be began to realize how big and how broad it was, the question came up, do we talk about Superfund? and trying to get a Superfund designation. And I will tell you that every one of us on the committee and every person on the council is saying, no way, we don't want the US government in here taking a hold of this and doing its thing. We didn't want that, that outside involvement from the outset. However, as time went on and we began to look at what the possible remedies would be, we realized there was almost nothing. Uh, ADEQ is not situated to deal with the Superfund situation. They have certain things they can and can't do. The EPA has certain things it can and can't do. Private entities, it's all voluntary on their part and there really wasn't the willingness to do anything that would be meaningful. There was some willingness on the part of uh, a couple of the property owners there to do something. But when we looked at what those somethings were, we realized there's no way to hold any feet to the fire. There's, there, it's doubtful that it would be fruitful because there was great skepticism from property owners and from some citizens that there was really any danger at all, even though the science very clearly said differently. And do you have any memories from this time? How were the community meetings? How were mem members from the community receiving this information. I think you talked a little bit about that. Is there any specific memories from that time? Yes, uh, I should go back a little bit and say that it was a very contentious time. The town had just incorporated uh, probably three years earlier, uh, approximately, uh, maybe two years earlier. But at any rate, the town was recently incorporated and that was a little bit contentious because there was a lot of people that were against it. Uh, and not long after that, the, the Young's farm was sold to uh, development. It was sold for development. And that was a real contentious issue because then came the people who owned the land, the new owners of the land, trying to get rezoning done and putting in subdivisions that a huge portion of the population was totally against. They said, wait a second, we understand it's not a farm now, but... but this 
and so there was a it was very contentious and so it went like two rounds of attempted rezonings and let's just say that politically it was very rough it uh, to say it was smooth would be all you can say is that we exercised processes and you know we stuck up for for those interests that we felt we should stick stick up for but it was not pretty so now the stage had been set for a lot of contentious interactions between all the different people involved, whether it's the local government or the, uh, the EPA or ADEQ or anybody else involved, those of us on the council, it was really rough seas. So when the, the suggestion of Superfund came along, the tempers were flaring immediately. There were people saying, absolutely not. There's no danger here. These people have lived here all their lives and, uh, and, and they haven't died yet, so there's no problem. Um, but once again, the science spoke very differently. The science was about risk, not about who, are we all going to die? And so I know that I read in the newspapers that you were a council member for the town of Dewey Humboldt. Were you first then a member of the Environmental Committee, Advisory Committee, and then you became a council member? Uh, no, I became the council member first, and then shortly after that, I was asked to join the committee. And why did you decide to become a council member? That was due in large part to the, uh, the Young's Farm situation. It was very contentious, and uh, so there were groups of people meeting on both sides of the issue. And I was a member of one of the groups that, that besides just trying to keep the farm land from turning into something really ugly and very city-like, which we felt the community was not embracing, and polls eventually showed that to be the case. They were not embracing a city type of atmosphere. They wanted a rural atmosphere, even if you did have housing developments. Well, uh, as, as I was involved in uh, one of those groups, there was a lot of uh, push to get more politically involved. And I was rather, <laughs> I was pushed toward the forefront of this group. Who could we get in this group that would like to run for council? In the end, I didn't run for council initially. I was appointed to council when a seat became vacant. And then that lasted for like eight months until I had to run for my seat, which I did successfully. Uh, can you describe how the town of Dewey Humboldt uh, Environmental Committee came into existence? Do you have any? Of yes, I can tell you. Tricia de France was one of a small handful of people who were very, very instrumental. You could narrow it down to about three people who did the most work to get the town incorporated. And so uh, it was still a small group of people that, that said, hey, wait a minute, once we incorporate, you know, we have to have a set of ordinance. We, ha we have to have something to, you have to have some ordinances in place no matter what when you're going to incorporate because you have to have not just some sense of order, but you have to have the basis for how you operate. Uh, and, and for a long time, we didn't have some of those. Uh, we had problems with abatement, things we couldn't legally do. If there was a, you know, even if there's a huge problem that's a public safety hazard, if you don't have the code in place that allows you to deal with it, you can't do it. Uh, Tricia had the force, the foresight to say, we need to think about the environment and we need to think about water. So she advocated getting these two committees started from the outset of the town. So those were put into, uh, might have been by ordinance, might have been by resolution either way. Uh, they were put in from the very beginning of the, by intention, from the very beginning of the, the setup of the initial set of ordinances. And do you remember who else was part of the committee? At the time, yeah, there were, there were various people that came in and out, but primarily there was Tricia de France, there was myself, Nancy Wright. Uh, for a period of time, Floyd Wright was involved um, with the committee. Uh, for a period of time, Jack Hamilton had a little bit of involvement. Um, and I think he, I think, um, you know, don't quote me. He might not have actually been a member, but he would always be at the meeting. He would show up at some of the meetings. Doris Salarius was, uh, she lived in Prescott Valley, but she had, she's very, very savvy in environmental issues. And so she was part of it as well. 
And uh, there were uh, a few other people that came in and out. Um, but uh, the bigger play, oh, Mike Randall was a member of the committee at the time as well. He is a doctor, and that was advantageous to have someone with that background on the committee. And you mentioned a little bit about how the committee saw this issue as something that it should take on. Just how did that start? Was there government agencies that came in and discovered the issue? It was just a hunch. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it, it, there had been, from the beginning of the town, a, 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 an informal tradition of meeting with ADEQ um, when the, on, on a quarterly basis. Now that didn't happen immediately, but by the time I had gotten onto the council and into the committee, there had been these quarterly meetings happening that, that was just kind of a catch up. Uh, hey, how are things going? And that didn't come accidentally. That came because there had been some issues with ADQ, uh, finding, uh, some behavior on the side of the, the Iron King mine primarily. Uh, where there were problems and uh, they needed to be dealt with, and there, you know, it was hard to get compliance, and so there was some back and forth with the town, and so that sort of rose up in importance that these quarterly meetings happen. Uh, we got the a the EPA got involved where when the EPA was needed to get involved. We they were asked in. I think initially because it was questions for them. What can you do? What should you do? And we began to learn the limitations of what the EPA could do, what ADEQ could do, and what any other agency that we might have been dealing with could actually do. So we ended up with these quarterly meetings where we get everybody together and say, okay, how are things going? Uh, what's the situation here? What can, what can we do about it? I should note that when the Environmental Committee was formed, as part of its forming document, the ordinance that creates it, said that it, that it described its mission and part of its purpose was to identify and assess. Now, I'm not quoting exactly, I'm paraphrasing, but identify was absolutely critical. That gave the Environmental Issues Advisory Committee the responsibility to not just wait until something comes along and present itself in a big, ugly fashion, but to be proactive about identifying something that is a potential or known or serious threat to the community. So it, it not only allowed us to be proactive, but it required us to be proactive. And do you remember how and why the town or the community began discussing the possibility of establishing a Superfund site for the Iron King and the Humboldt Smelter? I don't remember that it might have been 2007, it might have been 2008. I, I'm not remembering my years very well. I didn't go back and pull out all these notes and research. Um, but it was springtime and we'd had a quarterly meeting and uh, some things had come out of that and it became apparent to the environmental committee that this is a problem that wasn't going to go away. And so we said, well, what can we do about it? And around the springtime, if you'd have asked anybody on council and I was on council, would you, would you think Superfund? We just said no. The environmental committee said, well, gosh, if there's any way we can avoid it, we want to avoid it. We want to be able to solve this locally. Uh, but the more we looked at it, the more we realized there was not going to be a local solution. Because any of the solutions that were forthcoming, first off, there was a, there, there was a lot of political charge to this, too. There, there were people saying, go away, go away, don't look at this, don't try to solve this, there's nothing that needs to be solved. But as we were looking at um, documents that came from the EPA um, that, that were all about research that had already been done, we looked at these and we read, the I mean, reams and reams of documents on what the science was saying, what the conclusions were, and we're going, wait a minute, I, I think we really do have a problem here. And so, um, so we said, well, we're going to research further and research further, and then we'll decide if we really need Superfund. And as the research went on and on and on, we realized there was no other way to fix this. 
We didn't like it, but there was no other way to fix this. Can you tell me, I guess, your memories or stories, what happened at the government level leading to the establishment? How was the, I guess, the government functioning with all of this? Well, the Environmental Committee is part of government uh, as it is an advisory committee. But on the council side, it was very interesting too. There, there's always people counting votes, guessing how they think the council persons will vote and counting them up and going, where are we now with this? Do you think we'll have a majority? And, and that's a really annoying thing in government, but it happens and that's just how it is. It went from nobody on the council favoring this to slowly you could see meeting after meeting from various comments from the council persons, wait a minute, there's, there's a problem. There really is a problem here. There really is a problem here. And something's got to be done. What can we do? And wow, there isn't much of a solution. In the end, the environmental committee, we tried to be as impartial as we could be, but in the end, we looked at the reality and that was, we are going to have to decide what advice we as a committee give to the council. What's it going to be? And we looked around at each other and we we're all unanimous on it. We have to look at Superfund. There is no other way to fix this. There, and the sell to the council was interesting because we had each person on that committee, each of us had our own fortes and we divided up the task when we had to talk about, this isn't a matter of people dropping dead. This is a matter of elevating risk of things like cancer and presenting a risk that will last generations and generations and generations. We had Mike Randall talk about it because he's a doctor and he put it in really great eloquent terms. He cut to the chase. He did a really good job of it. When we had to talk about certain things, uh, uh, environmental systems, Doris Solarius would talk or maybe Tricia would. And so when we had to talk about uh, the, the things that, that brushed against the political natures, that was my ballpark. And so we had, um, we had a pivotal meeting with the council where we said, this is, this is it. This is our recommendation. This is why we're not crazy about it, but it is really the only way out. In the end, the vote was five to two favoring a letter to the governor asking for a Superfund designation. And at that time, it was Janet Napolitano, correct, the governor? Um, oh, my gosh. No, I, I, I would have to go back and look. Okay. Um, I th thought that, no, no, I thought it was Jan Brewer at the time because Janet Napolitano had already gone on to Homeland Security. Okay. And so it seems that it, uh, the interesting part is what you mentioned that you went through this whole phase, right? At first, you don't want the government to come in. That's um, right. And it seems like it was a sentiment with a lot of the political figures. Yes. But then as you started learning about it, it was something that you realized this is something that needs outside help for it. Yes. Um, I think something that's very important here is that as the environmental committee, we made no claims of anything. And Tricia was adamant about that. She said, we don't take on any claims. We bring to the council what we know from the people who are smarter than us. We are not scientists, but we're smart enough to read through this and figure out where we have to go for the next piece of information. So there were times that in a meeting we would say, well, yeah, well, you know, this is going to elevate the risk to, to, to residents living in this area. And Tricia would say, we don't know that. And I said, she says, no, we don't know that until an expert tells us that. And then we will cite that expert. Oh yeah. Okay. So she put us on a really, she really helped us be as politically neutral as possible. And I think that was absolutely critical because the environmental committee maintained its credibility as best it could throughout this whole ordeal. And I'm going to call it that because there were slings and arrows left and right the entire way. But nobody could look at us and say, you guys are frauds. 
because what we really did is we said, this is what these experts say, this is what these experts say, and this is what these experts say, and this is what they don't say. When we talk to, uh, we talk to an expert on mortality and morbidity, and he said, you don't have a big enough sample size in that area for us to determine one way or another if somebody's going to die from this. You don't have a big enough sample size, period. So you can't say, if somebody gets cancer and dies, you cannot say it was from that site. Okay, that's what he said, and that's what we reported. But the Department of Health Services said, uh, but you can say that there is an elevated risk, and here's the research that shows approximately what that elevation would be. So we reported that as well. And you were also working not only in the political side of it, but you're a community member, right, of Dewey Hall. Oh, of course. And so can you tell me a little bit about what was going on at the community level at this time? Um, once again, it was very contentious on the community level because from the, from the incorporation to the Young's Farm uh, development attempts to, um, to this, people were on one side or another. And, and, and it's not that there were just two sides, but there were generally two sides. There were the people that wanted to turn this into a city and the people that wanted to keep it rural. And that was so, sort of how the line was drawn, even if it wasn't really that accurate. And, and so it was very contentious. And you knew your neighbors and you like your neighbors and you knew that they hated your politics, though. They, they didn't like how you stood. Or another others just loved you and said, oh, you're our guy. This is great. It was, hard to, it was hard to work inside that, but you had to separate yourself from it. And that was the secret, is you separate yourself from the politics and you just do the work. The best advice I ever got from anybody, no matter what the, the subject was, was detach yourself from the outcome. Stop thinking about how you want it to be. And just do the work you need to do, and it'll manifest itself. And it always did. Okay, Lynn. Um, so I don't know if you can talk a little bit about the key players at the government level, and then also some of the key players at the community level. Okay, the, uh, at the government level, there's obviously the council. Uh, their town staff did what town staff does, and town staff was pretty good and pretty impartial about everything, and I really appreciated that. Um, at the, there was the Environmental Advisory Committee as well, uh, and we've talked a great deal about it. At the community level, there were a number of individuals that would uh, attend most of the meetings that they could. Uh, Jack Hamilton showed up quite a lot throughout this. Um, Ashley Preston, uh, made herself known, and she she came in uh, with a lot of concerns for her family, and she lived uh, she, uh, near the smelter, not really near the mine, but you know that's close enough. And you know when you get uh, parents coming in saying, "Hey, look, you know I'm raising kids here. I want to know that things are safe. You know what's in our water, what's in the air, and what's in the soil, and and uh, how's <laughs> how's this going to affect us?" It matters, and it really made a difference for them standing up saying so. There were uh, business persons and property owners that should be, I, I think, included here. They were key players as well. Some of them, I don't want to get into intentions or anything like that. Um, some of them, I, I would say, nobody says, I want to contaminate a community. And I don't think any of these businessmen wanted anything bad to happen to the community. I, 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 I can't see that. But it's many people don't believe that there is a threat when there really is a threat. Or many people might want to minimize the perception of a threat that might be there. I mean, they may not want to believe themselves that what they're doing is really that bad. Uh, even if ADQ says differently. Uh, if the EPA says differently, they still don't want to believe it. So I don't think their intents were to hurt the community, but they, um, but they have businesses to run and they don't want a lot of interference from the government or from the, from the local government or from anybody in 
you know, anybody for that matter, interference in their business. So you can understand that there's going to be a lot of contention coming from that side. So I don't hold much of a grudge because I see where their motivations are. But in the end, what's important is the safety of the community. And so it got to be really difficult. You didn't want to say, I don't like that guy. He's doing bad things. But at the same time, you had to say, you know, we're looking at reports here and it's, it, it's well-researched and there is an issue there and that needs to be addressed. On the community level, you would have, I mean, at any one time you could have dozens of people with, you know, pitchforks and torches, you know, figuratively speaking, showing up at town hall and, and creating, you know, quite a stir, you know, you know, lining up with the public comment period and, and voicing their opinions very vehemently sometimes. And you would get some siding very strongly with the business people saying, uh, they're not doing anything wrong. Nobody's died. End of story. And you get people lining up saying this is all about safety and lowering risk and and all of that. And so it got to be very tough. And there was a lot of, you could see the attempts at manipulation coming from the community. There's, you know, not that they could do that much, but you could see it coming and you would see people threatening, you know, we're going to vote you out if blah, blah, blah. Um, around that time, um, for various reasons, uh, I was I became the subject of a recall election. So they tried to recall me from the council, and uh, they tried to do that for Nancy Wright as well. And um, that recall failed. And so that gave us some indication that we were on the right track, that the public did care enough about what we were doing and that we were doing enough of the right thing that we were on the right track. We were representing the community properly. What you were asking earlier about the community, uh -huh. you know, Dewey Humboldt is, it's a very fiercely independent mindset here. There's so many people who move here, want to be left alone, move here, don't want the government involved in anything, you know? Uh, so it's, it's different than growing, different than living in a city. I mean, it's a lot of rural areas are this way. Yeah, I always wondered about that because it was a sharp contrast of my work in Tucson. Right, uh -huh. right. Now we're going to move on a little bit about you becoming mayor and how mm -hmm. all of that happened. I don't know if you kind of can tell us the story. Oh, I sure can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when Earl Goodwin was mayor, uh, it, it was very interesting having him, him as mayor because he was... A lot of people liked him, a lot of people didn't like him, but he was a stabilizing force uh, from a new community that had just incorporated, had two mayors that were both heavily involved in the incorporation, and so were very much trying to push that in a, in a particular direction. And um, there, was a, there was a lot of pushback against it. Earl was a stabilizing force. He was um, still... You have to talk to him about exactly what his intentions were, but he was not as pushy as he was wanting to do things right. Okay, so he said, you know, if we don't progress quickly as a community, that's okay. But we have to start at the foundation again and do things the way things ought to be done. Put the systems in place that need to be in place so that they can function. And so we're not doing things off the cuff. Because there was a lot of there was a lot of that earlier, just kind of uh, not as much direction as there could have been. And it isn't that it isn't for lack of people wanting to do the right thing. It was for lack of not knowing how to run a community and, and do government governance the right way. So um, Earl helped a lot to get things in place and things functioning so that you didn't have to maintain every little detail of government. It could function. And so he was good for that. Um, he served for one term, and I'll never forget, just, just out of the blue in one meeting when it was time for the time to announce that we're going to have an election, he just says, and I will not be running. And we were like, everybody was floored. And there was one other person, a prior mayor, who threw in his hat immediately and said, well, I'm going to run. And 
nobody was running against them. And I had people urging me left and right, well, you know, you're kind of well-spoken and, you know, you, you know, you would be a great mayor and all this and you should run. And I'm going, wow, that's not really what I wanted to do. But I thought about it and I said, you know what? It would, I should do this. It, it'd be a really good experience and, 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 and I'll be a little conceited here. You know, I, I thought I could do a better job. So, um, so I threw my hat in the ring and I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. And it was not, you know, it could be, I, some campaigns are really, really messy and nasty. This one was not so bad. You know, um, both sides were reasonably well behaved toward the very end. It got a little contentious as it always does when you get near the end of an election. But, uh, I had very good people surrounding me on my campaign committee. Um, I, I, one of my rules is, you know, I pretend I'm smart, but really what you do is you, you, all you have to be is smart enough to know that you get smarter people than you around you to help you. And that's what I did in my campaign committee. They steered me in ways that I didn't expect to go. And I ended up winning the election. It was narrow by 54 votes. So it's, uh, it was, you know, 52% of the vote. So it's not by much. Um, I was generally considered the underdog because people thought, well, this, you know, I was 10 years younger and this guy, <laughs> this guy's not going to win, you know? So a lot of guys, a lot of people didn't think it was going to happen, but they liked what I had to say. And I think that made all the difference. Um, I did a few little things that showed people that I really did care about the community. And, and it's not that the other gentlemen didn't, but, uh, it was the way I presented myself. And I think that's what put me over the top. So here I am all of a sudden mayor. I will say that's somewhat unrelated to this, but it's very important that people know. Newly elected people know about as much about what they're doing as the average person. Now, they know more because they've been campaigning and they've been researching issues and all that. But it is not uncommon for a person to land in a seat and go, wow, now what do I do? I had a much better sense of, of what I needed to do than most when they suddenly end up becoming mayor. But still, the learning curve, you know, there was a little bit of a learning curve there. But the, the, the most important thing is you maintain a little bit of humility and you keep those smarter people around you and you'll be just fine. And uh, can you, so this basically fell when the Superfund site was already uh, being established? The Superfund site, I talked about these in the springtime. We were like, oh, no way. We don't want to see this happen. By fall, we had, we had come to the understanding that there was no other way. And later that fall, um, we had the vote. Uh, I hope I get the timing right because, you know, like I said, I didn't go back and read through uh, town notes or anything, but it was easily within a year, not much more than six months that uh, we had made the decision and the council had decided that it was going to go ahead and go with the Superfund site. Um, it wasn't too much longer after that, that we got the news that we were listed on the NPL. Uh, let me tell you something that's, that was odd. And this is something people should know. The EPA works very much according to what is an empowered to very much according to what it's empowered to do and what it's disallowed to do. So it walks a very fine line in very many ways. There are times when it cannot tell you things. It keeps things relatively confidential to not taint the work that it is doing, to not draw political blowback. It says, we got it, we're working on it, we'll let you know. And so we went a long time having no idea if we were going to get listed or not. And so when we heard the news, we were just like, wow, this happened. And so that actually leads to my next question about uh, your collaboration with the different governments involved, like state, federal, local. Can you talk a little bit about how you worked with them through the process? And I don't know, maybe some of the memories that you have of that. Well, there's a couple ways. We, first off, we had the quarterly meetings with the EPA and ADEQ, and occasionally um, the Department of Health Services might be there. Uh, there might be other entities, depending on where, how far this had progressed and who we needed to hear from. And we tried not to waste people's time by bringing them in if there was nothing to say. 
Um, so there was that interaction, and you'd have the public involved. The committee itself could speak with individuals from these agencies too, but we self-imposed a rule which said if you're going to have any communication with any of them, you have to make a record of that, that you did and what it was about. Because if anybody ever wants to know, we want to be transparent about that. Um, there were certain individuals with the EPA that we, that we would talk to. There were two in particular. Um, but it was mostly for our own edification. You know, you can't lobby the EPA. You can't say, please, 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 this, that, the other thing. You can't do that because their decision is made very meticulously by people that don't know you and will never talk to you who are only looking at pieces of paper with results of studies, uh, reports, and that's where the decision making is done. And I think in this instance, it's a good thing because you don't get uh, political influences changing those decisions. The, um, we would speak with, uh, a, there were some people with ADEQ we would talk with. Um, we found that both agencies were good to work with. It's so frustrating not getting information because we're sorry we can't tell you that. It was really frustrating, but that's just how it was, and we understood why. Um, ADEQ and EPA were both very professional. They were good at telling you what they could tell you, good at being as helpful as they could be, but they were also good at not telling you what they shouldn't tell you. And, well, that's the nature of it. But I, uh, the, the, the interactions were always good. They were always professional. And we never felt like, with the EPA, we never felt like they wanted us to do one thing or another. It didn't feel like that at all. Um, with ADEQ, um, they didn't seem to have an interest steering us one way or another. It's whatever you want to do with Superfund because we're not Superfund. We have our own program, which is kind of like Superfund light, but it's really voluntary and maybe nothing will ever come of it, even if you, op if, if you go with it. Uh, it's a voluntary remediation program, and it really has no teeth whatsoever, and they know it. But they said, we're here to represent it, and we'll, we'll tell you what it does and what it doesn't do, and, and the whole thing. They're very good at that. So the interactions were really good, and we appreciated that they tended not to be very biased. Now, EPA, I would say virtually no bias at all. With ADEQ, you could tell that there was an interest in promoting safety because they are charged to do that, but you could tell that it was there. I had met one of the people that we used to talk to with ADEQ uh, socially years later, and he told me off the record, I'm really glad that you guys did what you did. You know, I wouldn't say so then, and, and it totally blew me away that he said that, but he had an opinion on this, but I wouldn't have known while we were dealing with ADEQ. And do you want, um, what do you want others to know about the Dewey Humboldt Environmental Committee, maybe something that was not well known? The, I think what's most important about the, the committee to understand is that, was that policy we had that Tricia was adamant about, and that is that we don't make claims. We just analyze what's out there. We report what's out there. We get together the best information we can get together, and then we present it the best way we know how. And we'll give our advice. You know, it, it, we're not going to be, we'll be neutral as far as the research goes. But when the committee has come to a decision on its recommendation to council, we're going to stick by that. And we're going to present it as best we possibly can. But the most important thing is that the Superfund might not have happened at all if the data said something different. If the data said anything differently, we would have gone where the data said to go because we were not going to put our own personal opinions into this unless we were asked, you know, if somebody asked me, how do you feel about, you know, what it will be like raising a family in that site? Then I'll give that opinion. But when it came to the science, that was not ours. It was always somebody else's and we would always cite where it came from. 
And what do you want others to know about your position as a mayor when the Superfund site was being established? Maybe something that was... Well, it's important to... It's important to note that I was not mayor at the time the Superfund was established. That happened just before I became mayor. So uh, I was on council at the time. Uh, and as I said before, it was a very contentious time politically. So that was tough. You know, when, when you're entering town hall and somebody in the parking lot is threatening you and the police wander over to be sure nobody's going to get hurt, you know, it's a little weird. You know, I didn't really, wasn't really that afraid for my safety, but it is weird to see that level of anger in some folks. And I understand it. You know, if you see somebody who's going to take a big step and bring in big government to solve a local problem and you don't go that way, I could see how you'd get really angry. And I don't blame anybody for feeling angry about that. Um, but Dealing with that range of emotions from that, that hurrah, support, love what you're doing to, um, to you know, one day they're going to carry you out in a bag, you know, it won't be me, don't worry, I'm, I wouldn't hurt you, but, you know, boy, it's going to go bad for you someday, you know, that sort of thing. You know, that's, um, that's pretty strange to be dealing with that much intensity. And that, I think the best strategy there is you do the work. You just focus on the task at hand and that's what you do. You do it as impartially as you can do it. And that's the best thing you can do. You're not going to make everybody happy. It's just not going to happen, but you got, just got to do the best you can do. What are you most proud of when it comes to your involvement with the Arizona, with the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site? Wow. What I'm most proud of would be that we did it right. We could have gotten, we could have gotten very political about it. And we could use the politics to drive the decision. But we chose to use the data and the science to drive the decision. It was risky. Of course, doing it politically would be risky too, because that can just that can cause all kinds of blowback and it completely goes the other way. But we made the decision that this is going to be about the science and this is going to be about how we present this. And, and if it goes, it goes. If it doesn't go, it doesn't go. And that's just how it is. There's a certain, there was a certain surrender in that because you can't control everything. And some people can try and maybe some people will succeed. But we weren't going to do this by trying to control the situation. We were going to do it by seeing if people get on board with uh, the message, the science. And do you have something interesting that you know about the history that you would like to tell? Maybe little known history of the area about pioneers, the Iron King Mine, Ironite, Humboldt Smelter, or Mexican miners, or anything of that sort? Ah, uh, I'm a big rail fan. I love trains. My brother and I, that's one of the things that uh, he and I would talk about extensively because he's very interested in the history of the area as it pertains to railroads. He likes the history too, but especially as it pertains to the railroads. And so, um, so my pasture, I have a fence around my pasture that's made from the railroad ties from the railroad that was there. And there's date stamps in there going back into the teens, last century. These are 100-year-old date spikes in a few of these ties. It's amazing. But uh, what the railroad did was, it was just amazing, the railroad itself, where it went, how they pulled it off, and uh, as it was slowly retreating into history, you know, parts of it being abandoned and, and salvaged. Um, it's interesting that the, the role that it played uh, in the smelter, uh, it, what's interesting is that the, the mine and the smelter, there was virtually no connection between the two. There was the owner of the, the Bluebell mine was one, and I'm trying to think of the other mine, I'm forgetting it now, DeSoto mine I think was the other, 
was owned by the same person who owned the railroad or at least had a controlling interest in the railroad. And the and so those mines, their ore was produced and refined in the smelter. And that's what it primarily worked with. The Iron King mine, its ore went somewhere else. And most people don't know that. Most people don't know that the two were not really that connected. There was a, there were a few experiments where they used some of the ore in the local smelter, but the smelter was geared up for what it was geared to do, and you know, and it did some other things uh, around uh, around wartime where they were doing some experiments, and you know, uh, let's refine this, this. Can we do something different? You know. So. Um, but I think it's very interesting to, to I, I'm very interested in the railroad and its history. And it, it's very interesting that ownership, that ownership, how it played into how things actually operated. The, the, there was a tipple at Third Street and the railroad tracks. And they would haul ore from the mine in a truck up to the tipple because there was a trestle and you can still see where this is if you look as you drive past the chevron station toward phoenix and you look to the right hand side you can see where the railroad went and there's a big gap where there used to be a trestle there um the railroad for a while stopped pretty much where the mine was and they used to load it on trains and stuff but at some point that trestle became unusable so they trucked it up third street to this tipple up by the railroad tracks and that's how some of the contamination got into where some of the yards are up by the uh, Sweet Pea Lane and, and up in that general. Now, Sweet Pea, there were, there were tracks right there, but not quite at Sweet Pea. A little further off the tracks, there was contamination. That's because that's where the trucks would go to unload. And there was a woman named Edna Richards who used to drive that truck for a period of time. She was the driver. There's also a story about how that truck, and not while she was driving, but how that truck backed up on the tipple. And when you raise the bed of the truck, you, you raise it slowly so that the, the ore will come out and into the cars. If you raise it too quickly, it unbalances the truck. And this happened, and it fell over backwards. And they, that was a, a big mess. But uh, I just find that an entertaining story. It's somewhere there's, I, I thought there was a picture of it somewhere, but I've never been able to find it. So I, if some, anybody has that, I'd love to see it. And then what do you think is important for community members to be aware that that might not know about the site? Oh, man. I don't think I can stress this enough. And it isn't just about this site. But it does apply to this site absolutely, but it's about um, environmental problems in general. And I don't like to think of myself as an environmentalist because that carries a stigma with it. But uh, I have served on easily a half a dozen or more water committees. I've lost count at this time. Um, one of which was very heavily involved in the developing the science of, uh, of what we need to know in this area. And so I would work alongside scientists and alongside people who were environmentally minded. And uh, not that I didn't learn some of these lessons when, uh, with the development of the Superfund site, but, but, um, but there I was working alongside scientists themselves having conversations with them. And when, you, when you're sitting on your couch on Google and you're looking up environmental issues here or issues there, you only get the tip of the iceberg. The rest of the iceberg looks like this. There is this whole community of people who study very intently matters of the environment, matters of water, its quality, its availability, the things around us, the ability of the earth to sustain humans on it. And that science is very well developed. People don't understand how well developed it is. Now, it's, it'll always change, it'll always, as time goes by, but it's very well developed. And there is a very strong picture of various threats that do face us as humans, but most people are completely unaware of this. You can't go to either side of the political spectrum and find people that will say, hey, let's trash the environment. What do you say? You're not going to find it. Nobody thinks we should do that. But lots of people have no idea how close we are 
to being in danger from the things we were doing to the environment. But it's happened before. If you look at Easter Island and at its history, you'll see a drastic demise, I'm not reduction of a population, didn't completely die out, but, uh, but the virtual wipeout of a culture because they misused the land. Because it was an island, it wasn't that hard for a group of people to influence the whole thing. In this day and age, since uh, World War II roughly, but since the, uh, since the industrial and the chemical revolutions, we've had the ability to damage mass amounts of the planet that we live on. And again, it's not like, oh, let's save the Earth. Here, Earth is going to be fine. We're the ones that might not survive when we're unable to sustain, sustain ourselves. We are very overpopulated as it is. We are seeing how it stresses resources. And one of the first resources that we're going to see disappear uh, to the point that it affects our ability to live is water. It will happen probably while I'm still alive, certainly while you're still alive. We will see it and we will say, oh my gosh, how did we get here? How do we fix this? And we will see how drastically expensive it's going to be. I can already tell you why water will be extraordinarily expensive because it costs a lot to get it from one place to another. We can make as much as we want. We can find cheap ways of desalinating water, but moving it around will be expensive. Not for us to drink, but if you have to grow crops where somebody wants to pay one one hundredth of a penny per gallon of water, but it's going to cost them a penny, that'll, that has massive implications on agriculture. So, my point is, there's a great deal we know about the planet and its ability to maintain our species. And I am so disheartened when I see people completely unaware. It's not their fault. They were never taught. We don't teach people the things they need to know most. Nobody will say, yeah, nuclear war, not a big deal. No, nuclear war is a huge deal. But we don't have a concept of how near or how far we are from it happening. That's the problem. The problem isn't that we're an evil species. It isn't. The problem is we are an uninformed species on the things that matter most to our survival. And thinking back on your experience at the Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? I would like future generations to know that it is their responsibility to know the consequences of whatever they do. The Superfund site came to be largely, not entirely, but largely because you had people generations ago who said, it is very important that we mine this ore. It is very profitable, but for various reasons we need to do this but they didn't take into account the effects of what they did. There were people at the time who said, there are things in here that are bad for us. They knew this. But it was not understood to a great degree how bad that was. We need to say, okay, we don't know for sure this thing that we're doing is really going to be bad, but if there's a reasonable suspicion that it might be, we need to not go down that road. Climate change is one of them. A lot of people were very convinced about it. Some are in denial about it. But I think without taking one position or the other vehemently, we need to say, if it is really a problem, then we need to act absolutely right now. Or we need to minimize it right now because the stakes are that high if it is a problem. And so that's why, you know, whether you believe, whether you don't believe, I know where the science is on it, but whether you believe or whether you don't believe, you need to act as if it really could be a problem. Because if it is, you can't afford the price you have to pay. Okay, Len. So my next question is, how would you like the memory of your experience to be remembered? Wow. I've... I have this philosophy that when you're in government, you don't expect your name to go on anything. You do what you do, and if you leave a legacy, then you leave a legacy, but nobody will remember who you are. 
You know, that's, that's, that's how I think about it. Because it isn't really important who did what, but that it was done. Uh, so my name's not going to end up on anything. And so the, the memory of this, I think what I want, what I would like for people to remember, you know, beyond who was involved, is that we saw this problem, we analyzed this problem, and we took action the best we knew how. Now, I'm going to temper that to say, if you ask me if I was 100% happy with how this has all turned out, I'd say no. I still believe Superfund was the right way to go because it was the best avenue to take. But it didn't turn out as well as I would like to have seen it because there were, there were problems along the way. There were data gaps. There, so there was some initial work done by the EPA, some investigation. And when they started putting all the numbers together, they have to get to what's called a record of decision. This is, this is what we found. This is what we're going to do about it. Here's the strategy. Let's go. Um, by the time they were pushing toward that record of decision, they said, wait a minute, this all doesn't quite add up. We can't make a decision based on what we have. We need to do more research. And so it was like, oh no, it was, it was, it was working so well on track. When we, uh, through the process of getting this super fund designation, um, one of the people with the EPA we worked with was Leah Butler. And she was phenomenal, soft-spoken. She was a go-getter, but you wouldn't know it because she, she was a great thinker because she understood what had to be done, what the process was, and how to line up the pieces so that it, so that it works. And she did this, and she was really good at it. But what happened is somewhere along the line, the pieces that we needed to have for that record of decision didn't seem to all be there. Now the EPA could comment more on exactly the details. I wouldn't be the expert on that. But when they got that far down the road, they said, wait a minute, um, based on what we've collected, we realized the problem is just a little different here and we need to redo this. And so they did. Then there was some changeover in the EPA. And so some, the ball might get dropped for a little while and then, okay, somebody picks it back up and let's go with this. And, um, and they would work on it. And it's dragged and dragged and dragged and dragged. And that is the one thing that I really regret seeing is that the community has had to wait and wait and wait and wait. Now, the EPA has come in, has done um, uh, emergency removals. So somebody's got a significant contamination in their yard and it's got to be dealt with. Then they come in and they do it. And they've done that. And it's great to see that that kind of action has happened because nobody else would have done that. So I'm happy about that. I just wish this had um, gone quicker. When people look back on this, that will stick out as a sore spot. And I, I know it will, and I'm not happy about it. But what I want people to remember is that we did the right thing. We looked at this thing from top to bottom, and we realized there was going to be no other solution. And had we left that untouched, this will be a problem for generation after generation after generation and on and on and on. Mother Nature straightens out things here and there, but 4 million tons of contaminated mine tailings. And if you look at some of the numbers of what's really in those tailings, it's, it's not good. That would last longer than the species would last. And how do you think that the memory then of the Superfund site and the contamination should be remembered? It should be remembered as a lesson, both in how we conduct ourselves at the time that contamination is introduced, but in how we show the discipline to take it and do something with it and not pass it off to the next generation. So I think that is, that's the most important lesson from this. And if we're, um, like I said, I'd love to have seen this work out a little differently, but we did what we did and I think we did the right thing. So it's all a lesson in how we conduct ourselves and then how we clean up after ourselves and being responsible. And how did you learn about the po progress of the cleanup of the Superfund site? Well, the EPA, uh, once we were listed, the progress of the cleanup, the EPA issues um, issues letters to people within the area 
So I get some letters that the rest of the community won't get. And it's just an update. Here's how things are going. Here's what we know. Here's what's new. And there isn't very much of that. Uh, because the EPA also has to wait around for the proper funding to do, because it you know has to juggle its various projects. So it has to uh, wait for the, the, the right things to be in place, money and the resources and everything, before they're going to take the next step. Uh, so there are these letters, but uh, there are also periodic, although not, not that regular, meetings with the council and, uh, and various community uh, efforts. There's, uh, there's been local groups. There was a, a CAG and a TAG put together uh, to facilitate between the EPA and the community and uh, help some communication go that way. But largely, there's been progress, but not at the rate that I would like to see it. So that, so that, so in short, the EPA does have methods in place that it uses to keep uh, some communication going. It's always open to feedback if somebody wants to take that initiative. But we've gotten to this point where the community is less fired up about this and more interested in like, well, we'll wait around till it gets done. Uh, so what was or was not useful when it came to the information uh, that was reported? So for example, maybe some of the language that was used, how they presented mm -hmm. it to you. I don't know. Sometimes it, maybe it wasn't uh, provided in a way for a policymaker like government agency. I don't know. Okay. The, while we were doing research on the environmental committee, everything they gave us was useful. I mean, it was because we would ask and in as much as they could deliver, they would deliver. And it was very useful. After the Superfund site came into play, some of the information was not as useful because a lot of it we already knew. Now to those of us who weren't on the committee and weren't in government and weren't keeping up with this, it would be like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so here's the phases, a feasibility study down the line to the record of decision and the actual remediation. You know, uh, that was news to them and that's useful and that's good. It wasn't as useful to us, but uh, one of the things that was difficult was after the, after the Superfund site came into being, the information you would get was generally useful, but it was the information you didn't get that you wish you had. That was what was the biggest problem. Everybody wanted to know timelines. How are we doing? How close are we? What's next? And the EPA was always good at what's next. But when, they couldn't tell you. I'm not going to say they wouldn't tell you because I know that the way they work, a lot of times they, they can't tell you. And so that was really frustrating. And so there was a certain level of frustration in that not knowing. If I could, if the EPA would come to us and say, this site will be completely done in January of 2021, no ifs, ands, or buts, finished. The community would go, okay, we'll take it. That's way further out. We were hoping this would be done by 2017. You know, that was our hope. EPA would absolutely not guarantee that. But um, that's what we were hoping. Um, but it's the stuff that you don't know and that they can't tell you that is the most frustrating. Were you surprised by anything that occurred through your longevity of the <laughs> Superfund site? Anything that was surprising, I guess, like maybe in community meetings or health studies being conducted? Well, prior to prior to the designation, when we were doing when we were working on health studies, trying to gather information on health studies, I was surprised that it is very difficult to definitively tie a disease to a place. If you have a cancer cluster, that's different because you have a statistically high number of people. But if you don't have a statistic, if you don't have a high number of people with an illness, you have to have a very broad sample size so that you can find statistical significance. And so what surprised me, because you know, you'd hear stories of, well, this person who lives in this area died of cancer. And everybody wants to know, well, was it related to the Superfund site? And some people would swear up and down that it was. But 
we don't have the sample size. We don't have this huge number of people dying because we don't have this huge number of people living there in the first place. Uh, so we can't tie any particular death or illness. You know, I can name off people right in my area, right in my neighborhood who have cancer right now. But I can't tie any of that to the Superfund site. Not that it there is no link, but we don't know that there's a link. We just don't know. So that is the part that I was surprised by because all this other science could say very definitively, hey, we know this. Boom, there it is. But the health studies, I didn't realize that we needed so many more people in that area to come anywhere close to getting a sample size that would give a definite link. What we do know is what the approximate elevation and risk is. That doesn't equate to you're going to get cancer or you won't. But that was a lesson for me. That was, that was something I didn't expect. Did you attend any community meetings about health studies being conducted in the area? Yes. Um, so before the designation of the Superfund site, obviously there were the meetings that involved uh, Department of Health Services. And we had, um, uh, we had talked to uh, a healthcare professional, the committee itself did, uh, talking about what's significant and what's not significant, and can you or can you not determine that there is a link between disease and the Superfund site. Uh, so there was, uh, there was that prior to the designation. Once this became a Superfund site, then there were, uh, there were meetings talking about, uh, the health. Uh, some of that was under the auspices of water testing because, uh, many of us had our wells tested as a part of the study of whether or not we had groundwater migration of contaminants. Then there was, um, metal study in children. So, you're getting arsenic, you're getting lead in your blood, what's the deal? And so my kids were part of it and they had uh, blood tests done and that went into the part of this uh, part of the study to help determine uh, was there a significant difference with people in the Superfund site, yes or no, and all of that. And you'd have to refer to that study. I'm not going to quote anything that I don't, that I'm not <laughs> the professional on. And did you uh, have any impact to your family, maybe, of that study, of the results of that study? Um, there was, yes. There, I can't comment on how statistically significant it is, but there were some elevated levels in both of the kids. Um, how that compares to normal... Uh, I mean, elevated, above normal, yes, but not really bad is, is how I would summarize it. Not really bad, anything like that. So it's not the kind of thing you go to the doctor and say, okay, now what do we do? It wasn't that bad. But it was like, well, this is a little higher than normal, you know, than, than what you normally find in the general area. You'd have to refer to that study to find out if how localized that elevation was. And was it arsenic or lead? Uh, it was, uh, it was both, but it was more lead than arsenic really, which, uh, was a little bit of a surprise. Now our well tested low in arsenic and some wells are not even in the site in this area because you have naturally occurring arsenic tested very, very high. So, um, in the end, the EPA said, you know, we're not seeing any significant, uh, groundwater migration problems with this. And so we weren't really worried about that. But uh, we didn't have, uh, now my kids don't spend a lot of time out and in the wash. And, and my land, there's a portion of it where the levels are, where they recommend, you know, just don't go there. Or if you do, make sure you wash your shoes and don't breathe dust from it. So don't do things that kick up dust. Most of my land is in really good shape for being right in the middle of the whole site. Some of the biggest problems in the Contaminated properties, contaminated residences didn't come um, directly from windblown materials or anything like that. I mean, there's, there's some of that. But the biggest problems came from people who needed fill dirt and they went, hey, you know, this is the 1930s or whatever. Let's go over to the mine and grab some of those tailings that are sitting there and we'll use it for fill dirt. And so you'd find yards at random spots in town 
totally contaminated. And then others that weren't right next door. And that was why some people would say, yeah, the, yeah, let's try throwing that on the driveway. You know, I don't know. And so that was the biggest problem. The way my land sits and where it is and the way the wind blows and all of that leaves most of my land in pretty good shape. So the kids can go out and have fun and do all this and that and the other thing. But there are certain couple of areas on it that we're supposed to treat very carefully. And what advice do you have for state and federal government uh, personnel that oversees the cleanup? <sighs> that oversees the cleanup. Keep us up to date on what's going on and ask for our feedback as much as you can get it. Make it easy for us to give you feedback. Uh, invite the feedback. In the end, I can tell you with great confidence that everybody wants to know when this is going to get done. We're not all stressing about it in a real big way. I'm kind of liking it. I didn't know this until after the Superfund site had come into play that uh, the county assessor's office uh, gives you half off on your taxes on the land portion if it's in a Superfund site. I'm like, well, that's cool, but I didn't know this. But for most of us, we just want it done. And I do too. I don't care about the, it's not much taxes and land anyway. But, um, uh, but I want to see it done. I want to see it concluded because there's, there's future development that we want to see happen eventually. And it's, it's, you can develop in a super fun site, but it's a little more complicated, a little more difficult. There's uh, the open space and trails committee would love to see some trails developed on some of the contaminated area, but they don't want to do it before it's cleaned up. So those plans have to sit on hold. There's some things that could be done that if this was all finished, it would open up more opportunity for either development or preservation or whatever the town wants to do. And we would like to get this done. Are you keeping up with the latest information uh, on the Superfund site? From what I understand, they did a lot of the residential, this emergency cleanup that yes. you mentioned. And now they're moving on to the plans on what they're going to do with the actual super, the Iron King mine. And I imagine also the Humboldt smelter. Yes. Uh, I'm keeping up on it somewhat. Uh, I'm been really busy with another couple, with a couple of very long-term projects and with a couple of organizations that uh, deal with either water or sustainability. And, and so that's been a little lower on my radar, but I've been somewhat keeping with it. I'm a little bit behind the times now on it, but, uh, but I have the advantage of being able to see whenever they bring the technicians in and they go in there taking samples or they're going and doing this or that and the other thing. And I just walk up to them and say, Hey, how's it going? What are you working on? You know, and usually they'll tell me, you know, they don't give they, they, they they're careful about how much they reveal. You know, they don't speak on behalf of the EPA. They say, yeah, we're in, we're just, we're taking these samples, blah, blah, blah. And that's what we're doing, you know, but, but I can see when things are happening, when things aren't and right now, it's really not much of anything going on. I pay more attention when I see that there are, you know, people in safety vests going in, taking samples and stuff. And then I'm like, oh, something's going on. Let's catch up. But it's been, the frustration is that it's taken a long time now. So I'm not as, you know. I'm interested, but I'm not as on top of it when I see nothing happening. Did you, um, did the Superfund site change your thinking about the sources of chemical exposure in your community or your household? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I was not an expert coming into this. Um, I learned a great deal. When you talk with scientists, and I don't mean read some flashy little article on the internet somewhere, sit down with a scientist, have a conversation. You will learn so much more than you could ever get from an article because you learn how the thinking works. And when you learn how the thinking works, you learn how you should be looking at it. When I see, when I see the way we treat trash, I'm like, wow, we are so much in the stone ages of how we should be dealing with trash. Why do I say that? Because I talk to people who deal with trash in one 
in one way or another, whether it's recycling, whether it's the effects of uh, what it does long term on the environment, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, from a resources perspective, whether it's from the possibility of contamination of water tables. You know, few people realize that when you contaminate a water table, what you've really done. Few people realize that. So when you talk to scientists, it completely changes your world. And it changed my world. You know, at first I was like, yeah, you know, save the trees. Yeah, it's kind of a good thing. Yeah, we'll, we'll save the trees. It's not all about saving the trees. It's such a... It's, caring about the environment is in my mind, what you have to do to care about humanity. And when you talk to scientists, you're able to see a much, much, much bigger picture than just saving a tree. Just saving a tree is not going to save the planet. It's not going to do it. You have to think about the magnitude of what we really do and how it treats us in return when we do what we do. Is there anything else that you would like to discuss that I might have missed in my previous interview question? In the end, we have to be responsible because we cannot kick the can down the road any longer. We have reached and exceeded the ability of the planet itself to sustain our population naturally. We're into where we have to use technology to sustain this population. This population is only going to grow. If you run population models, it's, we're looking at 12 billion people at some point. We don't have the water for that. We just plain don't. We can make it, but it'll be very expensive to transport it. It isn't that we can't invent the technology to do what needs to be done to keep us alive. But do you want to write the check? I hear people say, oh, I don't want to pay for such and such. That is so, you know, people try to shy away from environmentalism because what it'll cost. I learned by speaking with lots of experts that the costs will be so much higher if we don't deal with these problems now. Incredibly high, high in ways you can't imagine. You know that if you have a piece of steak on your plate, there's a thousand gallons of water that went into that one piece of steak, not the whole cow. That one piece of steak between its water that it drinks, the water used to grow its feed, all the way down to its processing, all the way to when it lands on your plate, there's a thousand gallons of water in that one steak. If water goes from a tenth of a cent or a one hundredth of a cent per gallon, which is what an, a farmer might expect to pay for it when he draws it from a well, to a penny a gallon, that 1,000 gallons turns into $10 worth of water instead of a few cents. Add $10 to the cost of that steak. That's an example I like to use that says when we have to pay for the technology to maintain what was free yesterday, we're not going to be able to afford it. Somebody is going to have to write that check. Who's it going to be? This is a really sobering question. So we, it behooves us to learn to be responsible sooner than later. Again, with water, you can make as much as you want. You can find ways of cheaply purifying it. Try getting it from there to where you need it. You know, we grow a massive proportion of the world's food supply right in the middle of the USA. That's a whole lot of pipeline to get water from the oceans to there. That's a tough order. How are we going to do it? Okay, Lynn. So let's talk about uh, your first image that you're going to submit to the photo essay component of it. And it's the Arizona Republic um, front page yes. news article uh, that was written about you in 2007. So can you tell me why you selected this image, what it means to you, and what do you want people to learn from it? Well, um, not just because it's me or because it landed on the front page, but that picture 
it, it, there's only me in the picture in these surroundings that are obviously contaminated. And I felt at the time like the environmental committee was setting out on its own through some forbidden territory to, uh, to go and research this thing that, that politically might not play well, that a lot of people were really not going to like. And so there was a certain feeling like we were really alone. And that picture said the same thing to me. Here's me. I'm out there. I'm in the middle of this. And it's like being, I'm alone in the picture. And, and we felt alone as we were doing this research because there was nobody else who was going to help us. It was come what may. And what do you want someone else to learn from this image? <sighs> that you can. That, that no matter what it looks like, no matter how hard something looks to do, you can do it. And so the second image uh, is this image of wind blowing dust. Can you also let me know why you selected this picture? What does it mean to you? And what do you want someone to learn from this? This is what it looked like before the Superfund site was established. Once the Superfund site was in place, there were some projects to minimize the, the blowing dust. Now, you have to understand that that dust is coming off a pile that has very, very, very highly contaminated materials in it, primarily lead and arsenic. And that is just blowing free in the wind. Now, it was generally, as far as we know, landing in less inhabited places. And I don't know how far the soil surveys went to, to determine. Um, in the end, that impact didn't seem to be as significant as the picture would show. But when that much dust was blowing off of that four million tons of tailings, it was quite a stunning sight, yet residents would largely ignore it. That's the strange thing. It was commonplace, and you would just ignore it. 